All right, lesson four. So last week we talked about how Jesus, what kind of Messiah Jesus came to be. And this week we're going to look at how people responded to Jesus. And I want us to see this week in our reading, we saw Jesus teaching in a new area. He moved from the area that he had grown up in, the land of the Jews. And now during this week, a lot of our reading has been him teaching in predominantly Gentile regions, which means these are folks that are not Jewish who haven't grown up with the same expectation of a Messiah. So he's moving into a new area. And it's also believed that most of Mark's first readers would have been Gentiles themselves. So when they hear this idea of Jesus moving into a Gentile area, they're going to put themselves in this story because they're associating themselves with the non-Jewish folks. And I also, sometimes it's helpful for me to remember that we culturally are probably more similar to the Gentiles ourselves. So we're all sort of starting from the same point this morning and our understanding of who Jesus is. All right, we're going to start with Mark 8, 29 and 30. And the other thing is this particular group of verses is pretty much the exact halfway point in the gospel of Mark. So Mark has been building his story. He's been telling us um, who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And we get to the halfway point and Jesus says to the disciples this question, who do you say I am? And Peter answers, you are the Messiah. And you're supposed to sort of hear, la, like this is the big high point of the story. Um, So we have the sense that Peter is beginning to understand who Jesus is. Okay, so Mark's goal was to show us that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. And I want us to remember that Mark, at the very beginning, in verse 1, he says this is the Evangelion, the good news. So he's announcing a victory. He's announcing that there's a new king. And he's talking about Jesus. And he believes that this is good news, that God has sent his son to achieve victory over pain, evil, and death. And that's what he's announcing with his gospel. And he thinks it's good news, and he wants to share it with us. Okay, so how do people respond to Jesus? And I want us to see there's essentially three different responses that people gave. Some were looking for proof or needed more answers. And I want you to sort of picture, I know this is odd, but picture like a football game, right? These are the people that are on the sidelines or who are standing back in the bleachers. And they're saying, I'm not really sure about Jesus. I'm looking at what he does and I'm evaluating it, but maybe I'm still skeptical. So that's the first group that we see in these stories. They're looking for proof or they need more answers. And they're coming to Jesus with their questions. The second group are confused or amazed and want to learn more. And this is how I picture the disciples, right? They're on the field, but they're on the field like my daughter is on the field when she plays kickball, which is to say she has no idea what's happening. But she's in the game. She's there. Um, But the disciples are confused, and they ask questions. And sometimes you think, are they tracking with this at all? Because some of their questions are so far out of left field. You're like, I'm not sure you really get this. Um, So they're confused or amazed, but they're in the game. They want to learn more. So they have that tiny little glimmer of faith, and they're looking um, to understand. And then in the third group, some recognized him as the Messiah and were willing to give up everything to follow him. So this is sort of the group that they don't have all the answers in the same way that I don't think any of us ever have all the answers when it comes to Jesus. But they recognize him as the Messiah and that faith translates into action. Remember we talked about that last week. The importance of if you have this belief that you take action in response to that belief. So this is sort of that last category that's willing to give up everything to follow him. Okay, we're going to read a story from Mark 8 where that, um, those last two verses come out. But I also want us to um, see that Peter makes this statement about Jesus being the Messiah after Jesus um, heals a blind man. And as we're talking through this story of Jesus healing the blind man, I want you to see, because I think Mark makes this connection because he puts these stories right next to each other in his gospel. But Jesus heals a blind man, and then right after that, we have this question about who am I, and Peter coming forward and saying what he believes about Jesus. Okay, so listen for the connection. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? 
The man looked up and said, I see people, they seem like trees walking around. Okay, so there's a few things. Jesus takes the man by the hand and leads him outside the village. So again, Jesus is removing him sort of from public view. And the other thing that I think is really fascinating about this, and you'll see this when Jesus heals people in different situations, the healing is tied to the specific need of the person. So if you're thinking about a blind person, they can't see. So they're hearing Jesus, but they can't see the actions that he's taking. So Jesus touches him to bring him into the process of the healing. He spits on his eyes, which is kind of gross, but it's tactile, right? The man feels that, and he puts his hands on his eyes. So again, the man is engaged in the healing process. Jesus is making sure that he knows what's happening. Okay, Um, And then we see that the man, his vision is still blurry. So he's, he's able to see, but it's not clear vision. He sees people and they look like trees, which I I love that Mark includes that detail because it's, it's so helpful for me to understand that this is a process of healing. Okay. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. So a couple interesting things here about this. Jesus touched the man's eyes a second time. So the first time he healed him, but his vision was still blurry. And then Jesus follows it up by touching him a second time. So Jesus, again, is going for complete healing, not partial. Um, And then his blurry vision becomes clear. So I want us to see that Jesus um, is helping to clear the man's vision in a two-step process and that it is a process, which every time I've read this story, it's sort of mystified me. Why did Jesus do it this way? Surely he had the power to heal the man instantly. He does that all the time. But in this particular story, he does it in a multi-step process. And so the question is, why? Why does he do it that way? Um, And I think it's tied into the next portion of the story that we're going to look at. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say you're one of the prophets. But Jesus presses the point and he says, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about them. So in this version, I want us to see that the same way that he healed the man, where he healed him once and he had partial vision, and then he healed him again again, and he had clearer vision. In the same way, Jesus is taking the disciples through this process and their understanding of who he is. They have a blurry idea of who he is, and they're giving them him sort of the blurry response. Well, some say maybe you're John the Baptist. People are trying to figure it out. Um, But the conclusions that they're coming to are not exact. And even when Peter makes this declaration, you are the Messiah, Peter is still in process of understanding what that means. Remember, we've talked about they have all kinds of ideas about what Messiah ought to be. And they're beginning to understand that Jesus isn't that kind of Messiah. He's a different kind of Messiah. Um, But they're trying to understand where this is going, what's happening in this story. But I also want to see that Peter has this moment of faith where he says, you are the Messiah, you're the son of God. We get that. We don't know what it means, but we understand that that's who you are. So I want us to see that this is, um, that faith is a process, that it takes people time, and the disciples are on their way and understanding what it means. But I also want us to see that encountering Jesus requires a response. Um, You cannot remain neutral about Jesus. When you have spent time with Jesus, when you've seen what Jesus does, Mark is letting us in on the life of Jesus because he believes that this is so important. And he says, you can't have a neutral response. Um, At some point, all of us have to have to come to a point where we're willing to say, this is my response to Jesus. And sometimes it might be We've got the blurry vision, and we need our vision to be made clear. Sometimes it's okay to acknowledge that there's a process of understanding that happens. Um, And I love that Jesus gives us these two stories alongside one another to help us understand that it's a process of understanding. 
in the next slide, we'll see that Jesus then, once, Mar- or once Peter identifies Jesus as the Messiah, then Jesus will go on to explain to them what sort of Messiah he is and what he's going to do. It says, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. So here, Jesus just lays it all on the line. He says, if you want to know what sort of Messiah I am, here's what it looks like. It includes suffering and rejection and even death, but God's going to raise him and he will rise again. So I want us to see, Jesus is very clear. He's, he's being honest with the disciples about what's in store. And there will be several times where as we go through Mark's gospel, where Jesus will come out and just say clearly, here's what's going to happen. We're going to Jerusalem. They're going to arrest me. I'm going to suffer and die. Um, But God's also going to raise me again from the dead. So Jesus is clear about this. And then you see the disciples almost immediately afterwards either arguing with him or saying, we don't understand what he's talking about. And we read it, and it's kind of funny because it's like, really, could he be any more clear? Like, he's telling you exactly what's going to happen, but the disciples don't seem to get it. And I want us to see that's that blurry vision. Until the story has reached its fullness, they don't completely understand, and they're on this journey of understanding. Okay. Um, Jesus is trying to teach them what Messiah came to do and how he's going to achieve victory and what sort of victory he will gain. So it's completely different from their expectations. They're looking for a temporary king. They're looking for an earthly kingdom, and Jesus is promising them so much more. And the route to that victory includes suffering and death and that's a new concept for them and that's a really hard one for them to understand because it is so different from their understanding of a victorious reigning messiah so they're they're arguing with him in part because that's not what they want from their messiah but that's what god came to offer okay the two-step um what i want us to see is that Uh, there's a two-step process, at least in this story. The blind man required a two-step healing process where he went first from blindness to blurry vision, and then his blurry vision became clear. And I want us to see that Mark aligns these stories to help us understand the process of growing in faith. The disciples were going through their own two-step process of understanding who Jesus is. And what I want us to understand is As much as this is true for the disciples, this is absolutely true for all of us. That we hear the life of Jesus, we understand it, and our vision becomes clearer over time. We're not going to have all of the answers to all of the questions, especially not at first. But what Jesus is always looking for is this little kernel of faith that is willing to give up everything in order to follow him. So it's a big jump based on a small understanding, but God is in the process of giving us more and more information about himself over time. Okay, and I also want us to see that God is the one who's responsible for clearing our vision. He's the one who's responsible for giving us understanding of who he is. And as our faith grows, our vision becomes clearer. And all of this leads me to a question. So if Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? He's asking the same thing of us. So at this point in the study, you're about halfway through the Gospel of Mark, and you've seen Jesus do a lot of things that no one else can do. And you've heard him make claims about himself that no one else can make. He's claiming to be God. He's claiming to have the authority to uh, heal people, but also to forgive their sin. Those aren't claims you can make unless you're God. So again, I want us to see there's no neutral response to Jesus. When he makes those kinds of claims, he's forcing the issue and asking us, what's our response? How do we respond to Jesus? So we looked at some of the three responses that people in the gospel are having to who Jesus is. And I want us to see that they're much the same that um, the same three options that we have in response to Jesus. So how are we responding to Jesus? Are you looking for proof? Are you on the sidelines? Do you need more answers before you follow Jesus? And I want to say that's a perfectly legitimate place to be. This isn't something you rush into without a lot of careful thought. So it's okay to ask questions and to look for proof and to uh, need answers. That is a completely 
great place to be. And the second is, are you confused or amazed by Jesus and want to learn more about him? Remember, I compared this to my daughter trying to play kickball. You're in the game. You may or may not have any idea what's going on, but you want to be there. You want to follow Jesus. You have a heart for that. You have a tiny kernel of faith that's looking for understanding. And Jesus loves that, and he's more than willing to meet us there. So it's okay to be confused or amazed by Jesus and want to learn more about him. That means you're sort of moving closer. And then the third option, do you recognize him as the Messiah, and are you willing to give up everything that is holding you back in order to follow him? And what I want us to see is this third level is sort of where discipleship happens. This is the beginning stages of following Jesus. And it sounds intimidating in some ways, this idea of giving up everything um, in order to follow him. But I want us to see what we're giving up is so much smaller than what we gain. Because what we gain is a relationship with Jesus the God of the universe who knows us completely and loves us completely. And what he's offering us is a relationship with him, and he gives us understanding over time. He makes our vision clearer. So I want you all uh, to identify which of these options best describes where you are today. And to say, none of these are a bad option. I, I think honesty is more important than trying to impress anyone. So I think it's great to be honest and say, I'm, I'm sort of here, or I'm sort of here, whatever it is, identify for yourself. I think that's a healthy thing to know where you are. And when you go into your small group time, I'm actually going to ask your leaders to have you guys go around the room and say, well, I'm in this first category right now today, or I'm in the second one, or I'm in the third one. So I'm going to ask them to ask you to identify where you find yourself today um, and to share it with your group. So be ready for that. And I want us to close by realizing that encountering Jesus requires a response. He claimed to be God, and he claimed to be able to forgive sin. So he's either telling the truth about that, or he's crazy, or he's a liar. Like, there's not a neutral option here. He either means what he says, or he's out of his head, or um, he's not telling the truth. So when what we believe about Jesus should be reflected by our actions, we talked about that idea that faith ought to lead us to step out into action. Faith leads to action. So where we find ourselves ought to be translated in the ways that we live our lives. And we're going to talk more about that next week. Um, but for now, I just really want you to quiet your hearts and think, where am I? I've been learning about Jesus. Am I, am I standing on the sidelines asking questions? Am I in the game but not really sure what's happening? Or am I at the point yet where I'm willing to say, I'm leaving everything else behind because what I have found in Jesus is more important than anything else I could ever do. So let me close us in prayer. And my heart is so much that you all would um, encounter Jesus in just a fresh new way. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are the Messiah and you are so different than what we expect and that you offer us complete and total healing and that you are in the habit of fixing broken things. And God, I just pray for the people who are in this room or who are learning from you and hearing my voice, um, that they would be willing just to quiet their hearts and assess where they are in response to you today. And God, I know that you will meet them there and that you are in the process of making blurry vision clear. And I pray that you would um, be clearing our eyes and our hearts today as we learn more about you. Make us willing to step out in faith and identify our need to follow you. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you all.